Good afternoon. The first item of business is portfolio questions, and the first portfolio is COVID-19 recovery and parliamentary business. If a member wishes to request a supplementary uh, question, they should press their request to speak button during the relevant question or press R uh, in the uh, chat function. Uh, I call question number one, Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it will provide an update to Parliament on when it plans to bring forward legislation to incorporate human rights treaties. Uh, Deputy First Minister John Swinney. In line with the ambitious recommendations from the National Task Force for Human Rights Leadership, the Scottish Government have committed to introducing a world-leading human rights bill during this parliamentary session, and we are on track to do that. The programme for government set out that we would be consulting on the bill in the coming year. That consultation and indeed the bill itself has been de developed collaboratively with a wide range of partners and stakeholders from across Scotland. We will continue to provide updates to the Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee on bill progress and timings. Pam Duncan Glancy. Uh, I thank the Deputy First Minister for that answer and I look forward to hearing what I hope will be a comprehensive update on the progress of the UNCRC bill next Tuesday in, in the Cabinet Secretary's statement. Can the Deputy First Minister set out when he expects to introduce specifically legislation on the four human rights treaties it is committed to incorporating into Scots law, including the UNCRPD and UNCDAW? And can you confirm whether you will seek appropriate legal advice and work with the UK Government to ensure future legislation is, is within devolved competence? Deputy First Minister. In relation to the points on legislative competence, obviously it is the obligation of ministers to ensure that that is the case and to present bills accordingly with the certificates uh, that make that point. In relation to the incorporation of um, other treaties, um, as I indicated in my earlier answer, uh, the Government is underway with this work. There will be consultation in the coming year, and of course we will keep Parliament in, uh, updated on specific timings. And of course, as we set out legislative programmes on a year-by-year -year basis during the parliamentary announcements, uh, further details will become clear to members of Parliament. Supplementary, will you ready? There is frustration about the lack of progress on the incorporation of the UNCRC, and I know there is going to be a statement next week. But can the Minister tell us that this will be the, the end of the process rather than another consultation or review group um, or process? Because um, we need to get this sorted quickly. So can the Minister guarantee that? Deputy First Minister. What I would assure Mr Rennie about is that while we have been addressing the issues in connection with the uh, the specific points raised by the Supreme Court, which will be the subject of my statement to Parliament on Tuesday. Uh, we have also been undertaking the preparatory work to implement the uh, elements of the Bill that uh, are uncontested in terms of the Supreme Court judgment. So that work is underway, and uh, my statement will obviously update Parliament on where we have reached our consideration of the Supreme Court judgment. And supplementary, Stephanie Callaghan. President Officer, the Scottish Human Rights Commission has expressed concern over UK Government plans to bring forward legislation to replace the Human Rights Act with a new Bill of Rights. Can the Deputy First Minister confirm whether proposed reforms could take place without unsettling current devolution arrangements and what actions the Scottish Government will take to oppose any regressive proposals? Deputy First Minister. I, I, I am at this stage unable to give Stephanie Callan the reassurance that she understandably and rightly seeks. The Human Rights Act of 1998 is embedded in the legislation that led to the establishment of this Parliament. And the powers of this Parliament and the way they are exercised is inextricably linked to the provisions of the Human Rights Act. Now, the fact that the United Kingdom Government is now going to um, essentially replace that legislation um, raises all sorts of issues about the consideration and the handling of human rights issues, but it also raises the danger that the devolution settlement upon which this Parliament is founded may be destabilised as a consequence of that legislation. Now, we do not know yet the answer to that question. We know that there is new human rights legislation um, emerging. Once the Bill is published, we will scrutinise its content very carefully in order to assess its full impact, we will update Parliament, and I can assure Stephanie Callaghan that the Scottish Government will resist any attempt to, in any shape or form, diminish the human rights that were entrenched in the Human Rights Act of 1998 and which led to the foundation of this Parliament. Um, 
before I call question number two, I understand Mr Whittle would wish in advance to apologise to the Chamber, as he has advised he will need to leave the Chamber immediately after he has asked his question. Question number two, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what consideration it has given to improving data collection and data management across government as part of the development of policies relating to the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Deputy First Minister. The Scottish Government is committed to improve data gathering and management to produce high quality and impactful research supporting our recovery from the pandemic. This includes the Data and Intelligence Network, a community of data experts promoting best practice on the sharing and use of data in response to the pandemic. The network has produced a range of resources, including a data catalogue and work to improve data set quality. Research Data Scotland provides a way of systematically organising Scotland's data and offering researchers a quicker and clearer access to data. It developed the COVID-19 database for quick data set linkage, now holding 36 data sets and supporting 68 COVID-19 related studies. The Business Support Partnership Programme Data and Analytics Workstream is also seeking to improve data set linkage abilities to gain a more holistic view of business support offered during the pandemic. Brian Whittle. Sorry, Deputy President, Officer, I should have obviously uh, 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 acceded to, to the fact that I, I do have to leave uh, straight after my question. I have a constituency case. Can I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will appreciate that throughout the pandemic, having easy access to reliable data on everything from COVID cases to details of businesses eligible for support has proven vital in protecting the public and allowing our response to the virus to be as targeted as possible. As we look to recover from this pandemic and build greater resilience against future challenges, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that improving how the Scottish Government gathers, stores and uses data could bring significant benefits in every policy area, from future NHS workforce planning to health outcomes to hitting educational attainment targets? And if he does agree with those steps, what, sorry, if he does agree, what steps is the Scottish Government doing to address this shortfall? First Minister. So, so the, the, the issue of data management is central to uh, every aspect of government policy and government actions. It helps us to identify uh, the, um, the, the, the most effective targeting of support to assist individuals who may face difficulties during the cost of living crisis, for example. Um, it helps us also to manage effectively the uh, implications of COVID in the National Health Service and a whole variety of different uh, other elements. The programmes that I have set out through the Data Intelligence Network um, is designed to ensure that we are constantly reviewing that approach to data management and data handling uh, to ensure that we achieve all of our objectives in this respect and that we can effectively deliver uh, government policy. I think what we have learned from the COVID pandemic is that we need to have in place systems that can readily deal with the distribution of resources to a wide range of recipients, whether they are individuals or businesses. Uh, and that obviously um, had to be developed at pace during the pandemic, uh, but we are obviously looking to entrench those approaches to ensure that we can be equipped for any eventuality in the future. And this, of course, is material to the Coronavirus Recovery and Reform Bill, with which Mr Whittle is familiar. Question number three, Craig Hoy. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what cross-government discussions regarding the remaining COVID-19 hospital restrictions have taken place as part of its COVID recovery strategy. Deputy First Minister. As COVID-19 infection prevention and control guidance is confined to healthcare settings, there are limited cross-government discussions outside of health directorates regarding COVID-19 mitigations. Development of Scotland Hospital COVID-19 guidance is done in conjunction with NSS Antimicrobial Resistance and Infection Prevention and Control and supported by the independent expert group COVID-19 Nosocomial Re Review Group. Scottish, the Scottish Government continues to work in partnership with NSS and with relevant policy teams in reviewing and, updated, uh, and updating COVID-19 hospital guidance in light of emerging scientific and World Health Organisation advice. Craig Hoy. I thank Mr Swinney for that answer, but ongoing COVID restrictions in Scotland's NHS are causing avoidable harm to, um, avoidable harm to uh, 
patients and are restricting patient flow, which results in ongoing pressure on waiting times. Does the Deputy First Minister agree with me that appropriate hospital visits play an important role in the patient's treatment and recovery? And as part of his uh, COVID recovery strategy, will he commit to working closely with ministerial colleagues and officials to ensure that normal processes and procedures are resumed and maintained in hospitals, wherever this is clinically safe and possible? Deputy First Minister. Um, I, I, I do agree with the last part of Mr Hoy's question that um, hospital visiting when it is sa clinically safe to do so is, um, is, is absolutely essential. But I rather part company with him uh, with the start of his question because it rather suggested that that is not the approach that we should take. Because all of what the government is doing is founded in clinical analysis in relation to hospital visiting. And I, I think we have to be very careful. We are all familiar with the issues of nosocomial uh, transmission, uh, transmission of, um, uh, of COVID. We have to be very careful to ensure that we are taking the right clinically advised steps in relation to hospital visiting so that we can protect the, the population that is in hospital and those who are visiting uh, for legitimate purposes. So, um, yes, we will take an approach which is driven by clinical um, analysis and clinical advice, and it must be, as a consequence of that, um, uh, we must make sure it is safe for individuals to be visiting in such a context. Question number four uh, was not lodged. Question number five, Paul McLennan. To ask the Scottish Government what role a COVID-19 booster vaccination programme this winter will play in its COVID recovery strategy. Deputy First Minister. President, officer, vaccination remains a critical component in our response to COVID-19. Since its beginning, the Scottish Government's COVID-19 vaccination programme has been guided by the expert advice provided by the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation and senior clinicians. Uh, JCV advised in February this year that an autumn winter booster programme for 2022 is likely to be recommended for those at higher risk of severe COVID-19, such as those of older age and in clinical risk groups. The JCVI will continue its ongoing review, and the Scottish Government understands that the Committee is likely to make a further announcement with more precise details of timing and eligibility for the anticipated autumn winter programme in the coming weeks. We stand ready to consider any further guidance from the JCVI as it is issued. Paul McLennan. Can I thank you, Deputy First Minister, for the answers. Can I ask what consultations have taken place with local authorities and health boards in regard to possible vaccine venues this winter? Deputy First Minister. Uh, President, the, 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 there is an ongoing dialogue, dialogue with local authorities and health boards about the delivery of the vaccination programme, and particularly in relation to the issues of convenience and locality for individual areas. Um, this is obviously a very complex exercise, and the, the vaccination programme has led to the, vaccine, you know, the distribution of in excess of 10 million vaccinations in a relatively short space in time. So uh, the, the programme, obviously, when it operates at scale, at population-wide scale, um, opens up different opportunities uh, around locations than if it is a, a more limited vaccination programme for older people and for the clinically vulnerable. And, of course, if the programme is targeted on those groups, the issues of access and locality are ever more significant. So I, I assure Mr McLennan that these questions will be considered very carefully with local authorities and health boards as we apply the JCVI advice. A supplementary, Jackie Bailey. A constituent caught COVID in February this year, and now three months later, she has it again. She is completely vaccinated. It was bad before, but this time it has flawed her. Given that Omicron variants BA4 and BA5 waves are on their way, I am pleased that the Cabinet Secretary is indicating an extension of the booster programme. Could I encourage him to look at this particularly for those aged 50 and over, including those with underlying health conditions like diabetes or asthma? Um, will he urge the JCVI to move quickly, given that both these new strains are thought to be very contagious and there is a level of vaccine es escape? Deputy First Minister. Yeah, all of these are, are legitimate points, and I'm sorry that Jackie Bailey's constituent has had the experience that uh, she has had. Um, I, I think the, uh, Jackie Bailey will be familiar with the fact that the government follows and has followed to date as of other administrations in the United Kingdom, the advice of the JCVI. We have made clear to the JCVI at different stages uh, our uh, enthusiasm for 
um, uh, elements of the vaccination programme to be undertaken, and for that to be undertaken perhaps at faster speed than ordinarily might have been the case. Um, so I will certainly discuss the issues that she's raised with me with the Health Secretary, um, who leads on dialogue with the GCVI in that respect. But fundamentally, Jackie Bay will understand GCVI operates independently of government uh, and provides high quality clinical advice to government. Question number six, not large. Question number seven, Sarah Boyack. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what modelling it has undertaken to estimate the impact on its COVID recovery strategy of removing population wide testing and contact tracing at the end of April. First Minister. So the decision to make these changes to our testing policy was informed by the latest available evidence and advice from public health officials and clinicians. This included modelling the epidemiological impact of the changes in testing policy. The Scottish Government continues to model the latest COVID-19 trends, and these results are published online in the Modelling the Epidemic report. Alongside our evolving response to the pandemic, the Scottish Government's COVID recovery strategy will continue to focus effort on bring, on, on, and resources on bringing about a fairer future, particularly for those most impacted during the pandemic. Sarah Boyack. Can I thank the Deputy First Minister for that answer and ask, given the challenge of new variants, most recently those identified in Portugal and South Africa, what risk assessment the Scottish Government has done on the impact of ending routine testing, given the ongoing health issues raised by Jackie Bailey as well as long COVID? And does the Deputy First Minister agree that without a commitment to free vaccines in low-income countries and across the globe, we are not safe until everyone is safe? Deputy First Minister. Uh, I, I agree entirely with the, the, the latter part of Sarah Boyack's question. And um, indeed, over the course of the vaccination programme, the Scottish Government has um, supported practically and in terms of the pressure we have applied to achieve exactly the objective that Sarah Boyack has set out. Um, as I indicated in my earlier answer, uh, the, 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 the change to testing policy uh, was included in the modelling of the pandemic. Uh, we are obviously continuing to monitor levels of COVID within our society. There are various um, uh, modelling exercises uh, undertaken in that respect around um, wastewater, for example, which is showing declining prevalence of the virus, and then also in hospital admissions and in cases. Uh, and obviously, in relation to new strains and new variants, uh, we will continue to engage with the international clinical community on the research that is emerging in, uh, in, in that respect and to be able to reflect that in the choices and the decisions that we make. Question number eight, Daniel Johnson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government for what reason a number of written parliamentary questions have not received an answer by ministers uh, within the required timescale. Minister George Adam. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank the Member for the question. The Scottish Government is committed to answering all parliamentary questions as quickly as possible within the deadlines agreed with the Parliament. In the first quarter of 2022, the Government answered 90 per cent of written parliamentary questions on time, exceeding the Parliament's own 80 per cent benchmark. The Government produces quarterly statistics available for the Scottish Parliament Information Centre, which show how many parliamentary questions were cleared after the substantive date and those still outstanding at the time of audit. Daniel Johnson. I, I thank the Minister for that answer, but I think the number of wry smiles around the Chamber probably points to the fact that somewhat, things are somewhat awry. Uh, from the, the, the picture he paints. Indeed, there's a growing problem, and it's not just opposition members, but I've also had this conversation with SNP backbenchers as well, that there's a problem both with the timeliness, but also the quality of, of answers. I've had three answers that have taken over four months from the Cabinet uh, Secretary. It's not just timeliness, but it's also the quality. I had an answer from the Cabinet Secretary for Education, which was simply a hyperlink to myjobscotland.gov.uk. Answers that just refer me to SPICE, as good as their work is, I know where they are. I can ask them myself. Also, uh, answers which are just linked to previous answers, regardless of their age, some up to six months old. And I want to know the answer from the government today. And, it's, and ultimately, it's not just me or other members that the government's letting down. It's my constituents, because I'm asking questions on their behalf. So can I ask the Minister to reflect on this? Because ultimately the answers given should be to, uh, considered to be answers to the whole Parliament. And if Ministers aren't happy to answer, answer uh, questions in the way that they do written in the Chamber, they shouldn't be submitting them as written answers either. So will the Government 
uh, uh, undertake to improve matters, both in terms of time, but also importantly, quality of written parliamentary answers. Minister. Thank you, President Officer. In regards of time, uh, we are, as I repeat again, 90% in the first quarter were replied in time. But there are many factors the member should take into effect for the impact on the time it takes to provide substantive answers to written PQs. Resourcing pressures for the government need to prioritise activities, as example, by a response to the pandemic. However, delays can also be caused through difficulty in the interpretation of the questions or taking steps to ensure answers are properly re uh, researched, accurate and, above all, open and helpful to members. So, as always, I will try to be as open and as helpful to uh, all of the members of this chamber at any time. And any time if the member wishes to have a chat or discussion about any of the issues, my door will always remain open for Mr Johnson and others. Supplementary Stephen Kerr. With no hint of irony at all. Um, with any form of majority government, if anything, it's more important than ever that the strongest standards in transparency and scrutiny are upheld. Just this week, we heard of the abysmal adherence to the freedom of information laws from the SNP government, with shady interventions from ministerial advisers going undocumented. Written questions are treated with similar disdain by the Scottish Government, often not addressing the question or simply stating that they have already been answered when they haven't. Presiding officer, with the Scottish Government in the news for its secretive handling of the Ferries fiasco, should Scottish ministers not be doing far more to earn the public's trust? Minister. I think Mr Kerr will understand that we had a public opinion poll only two weeks ago and the public trust was with the SNP. So, once again, once again, presiding officer, we have Mr Kerr's hyperbole when it comes to his interpretation of what is actually published out there. And I think we need to be very careful when we're discussing these matters, because Mr Kerr seems to just think that he can say what he likes, when he likes, and just shout about absolutely anything, and he is correct. His interpretation is not the same as everyone else within this room, so he needs to have a wee thought to himself about how he conducts himself in future. That, that concludes portfolio questions on uh, COVID-19 recovery and uh, government business. Um, we will now move on to the next portfolio, which is, sorry, could we just have a bit? We will move on to the next item of business now, please, uh, so everybody is in place and following the proceedings. Question number one on the portfolio net zero energy and transport will be Gordon MacDonald. And I would remind all members who wish to ask a question, a supplementary question, to please press the request to speak buttons during the relevant question or to enter the letter R in the chat function. I call question number one, Gordon MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what measures are available to stakeholders seeking to manage invasive species and mitigate their impact. Thank Minister, member, Min, Minister Lawrence Slater. I thank the member for the question. Invasive non-native species are a key driver of biodiversity loss. It is estimated that they cost the Scottish economy around £300 million annually. The management of inns is fundamental to our efforts in tackling biodiversity loss. The Scottish Government provides funding streams to stakeholders seeking to manage non-native invasive species. Funding has been available, for example, through the Forestry Grant Scheme, the Biodiversity Challenge Fund and, through Nature Scott, direct funding for projects of strategic national importance, such as the Scottish Invasive Species Initiative. The new Nature Restoration Fund also includes management and eradication of inns in its objectives. Gordon MacDonald. I thank the Minister for that answer. A survey found that there are American mink present in the Pentland Hills Regional Park in my constituency and that their presence can have an absolutely devastating impact on native mammals and ground nesting birds. Does the Minister share my view that there is a pressing need to keep the impact of invasive species on Scotland's ecosystems to an absolute minimum and that steps should be taken to ensure that they do not undermine work to restore and enhance biodiversity. Minister. 
I do indeed share Mr Macdonald's view, and this is why we are providing support to projects like the Scottish Invasive Species Initiative, which is tackling both invasive plants and mink along rivers in an area of 29,500 square kilometres in northern Scotland, over a third of Scotland's total area. In the past four years, over £1.5 million has been invested via the Scottish Rural Development Programme to tackle rhododendron, which threatens our precious Atlantic rainforests. However, we do recognise that there is always more that can be done. And there are a number of supplementaries. Uh, I'll take the first one from Maurice Golden. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Beaver activity can and is having a negative impact on farmland, biodiversity and rural communities especially in Tayside, where they were released either accidentally or illegally. The Scottish Government's new translocation scheme aims to help, but it still lacks details. So can the Minister provide answers to the following questions? When will the new rules launch? How many trappers have been trained? How many translocation sites have been identified? And how long will the scheme be funded? Minister. I, I thank the member very much for that question. I'm actually really excited about our beaver translocation initiative. And you know, it's an excellent way of managing where there are conflicts between beavers and other land users. Although, actually, I disagree with the member about biodiversity loss. Beavers are excellent at improving biodiversity by creating natural wetlands. And they are themselves a reintroduced species. When my father grew up here, there were no beavers, they were extinct. So this is a success in Scotland. The uh, beavers, uh, we're going to publish a new beaver strategy. I believe that's to be published in June, and I very much expect that that member's answers will be in that strategy. And supplementary from Alistair Allen. Okay, and supplementary from Faisal Chaudhry. Deputy Presiding Officer, what measures are available to the Scottish Government to ensure that uh, invasive species are not being brought into Scotland through international airports? Minister. Uh, I thank the member very much for this question. Of course, this is a very live issue for us, given the issues around Brexit and the now delay of 1800, 18 more months on the checks at the border checks. So this is a particular concern to my plant health colleagues. We're very concerned about biosecurity, and I'm happy to write to the member in more detail about that. Question number two, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on using Scottish Waters Reserves to fund a £100 rebate for customers. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. It's vital, it's vital important that Scottish Water continue to invest in infrastructure to provide a high quality service to the people of Scotland. Revenue raised from customer charges is essential to deliver Scottish Water's investment programme. Scottish Water's cash balance is not a surplus of funds. It is substantially allocated at any time to investment projects on a rolling basis. The average water charges in Scotland is already lower than that of the average in England and Wales. And also from the 1st of April 2021, we increased the maximum discount available from the water charges reduction scheme, which is available to customers in, full rece in receipt of full council tax reduction to 35% up from 25 per cent. This enhanced uh, scheme is providing support to over 470,000 customers. Jackie Bailey. I am grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that response, but at a time when Scots are experiencing the worst cost of living crisis in a generation, Scottish Water is sitting on at least £500 million of reserves, and their senior executives are getting eye-watering bonuses, not salaries, but bonuses of £92,000, three times the average wage. Does the Cabinet Secretary believe that this is right? And will he now rule out further rises of RPI plus 2 per cent for next year, given that inflation is expected to be at least 10 per cent? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, as I mentioned, the uh, uh, cash reserves which uh, Scottish Water hold um, are not a surplus of funds. They are actually cash reserves which are there for identified projects uh, which have to be uh, delivered and they have to then hold a working cash balance which is allocated as those investments roll out and it must hold that within it. That is exactly what that funding is helpful. That will go up and down during the course of the year and over uh, different years. So I think it is important that the member understands how the budgeting process operates, which she clearly does not, uh, given her question. And in relation to the support that we are actually uh, providing, uh, the member will recognise that by extending the council tax uh, support scheme that we provide for uh, Scottish water charges, it means that because we have extended it to 35 per cent, 
It means that those households which are in receipt of full council tax reduction discounts actually pay less in this year's water rates than they did back in 2021. And as a member will also recognise that targeting support during the cost of living crisis to those households who have the lowest income is a key priority. And that's exactly what this scheme does. It supports those households who have the lowest income to assist them with their water charges and actually this year reduces their water charges. Before I, thank you. Before I call uh, the next, uh, well, it will be a supplementary, can I just please ask members that if a question has been asked, it would be courteous to listen to the answer. Thank you. Uh, I, I call supplementary on question number two from Liam Kerr. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On a very rough calculation, the Chief Executive Officer and managers of this publicly funded company cost around £1.5 million, as well as the bonuses that Jackie Bailey talked about. Has the Cabinet Secretary reviewed whether such spend provides value to the public purse and considered whether such public funds could be used to reduce bills? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, as the member will recognise, the Board of Scottish Water are responsible for the rumination package of their uh, staff and including their Chief Executive. Uh, but when it comes to uh, uh, value for money, uh, we just have to look at the base salary packages for some of the uh, water organisations in England. Uh, where they go up to almost, in some cases, almost a million pounds. But clearly, uh, the level that Scottish Water's chief executive is paid at is actually considerably lower for a comparable size organisation in other parts of the UK. But it's important that we make sure that we are using public money efficiently. And I'm sure the member will recognise that Scottish Water has actually now been voted by its customers as one of the most efficient and effective public utilities in the UK given the progress that's made in its investment, recognising the significant progress we've made. And the important thing is, the money within Scottish Water that it makes stays in Scottish Water, unlike the privatised systems that the Tories operate. Question number three, Liz Smith. To ask the Scottish Government how it will respond to the UK Government's consultation launched on the 9th of May regarding the proposed expansion of its warm home discount scheme. Minister Patrick Harvey. Thank you. The Warm Home Discount uh, is a GB scheme, providing an annual £140 rebate to around 210,000 vulnerable Scottish households. Last year, we proposed an expanded replacement scheme, but this, sadly, was not agreed by the UK Government. So the, the UK's new consultation proposes to continue the current scheme separately in Scotland with uh, just a £10 increase. We will, of course, be urging the UK Government to listen to Scottish stakeholders and do much more to protect the most vulnerable households. Liz Smith. Thank the Minister for that response, but it is my understanding that the uplift would mean rebates are provided to an additional 50,000 families in Scotland on top of the 230,000 already receiving uh, rebate payments. So can I ask the Minister to confirm that he is not in any, or the Scottish Government is not in any way going to disrupt these additional payments, which could be very considerably important to families across Scotland, including in Mid Scotland and Fife. Minister. Uh, well, Liz Smith is, is correct about that uh, figure of 50,000 more households. I think it is worth putting that in context, of course, because the, the price cap uh, rise uh, last autumn created 50,000 more fuel-poor households. Then it rose again in April, pushing 140,000 more households in Scotland into fuel poverty. Uh, and uh, further big increases uh, in energy prices are anticipated in October, and we fear uh, that could see almost a million Scottish households uh, in fuel poverty by this winter. So, in comparison with those figures, I hope Liz Smith will acknowledge that extending support to 50,000 uh, is a pretty paltry response to the cost of living crisis that the Conservative Government is overseeing. Supplementary, Fiona Hislop. Does the Cabinet Secretary, uh, sorry, the Minister, acknowledge that uh, while all measures to support households with rising energy prices, including energy efficiency measures, are welcome. The crisis is now, and although existing measures, uh, including the Warm Homes Discount Consultation, that further £13 million is welcome, support is not being put in place fast enough or at the scale needed, with Ofgem now estimating that 613,000 households in Scotland are in fuel poverty. 
What discussions has the Minister had with the UK Government about more immediate assistance to deal with energy price increases now as a wait-and-see approach as set out by the UK Minister Greg Hans last week to our Parliamentary Committee is just not acceptable or good enough? Minister. Well, I, I certainly agree with Fiona Heslop's characterisation of the, the scale and pace uh, of a response that is required and that this is very clearly lacking uh, from the UK Government. I, I mentioned in my first answer uh, that we have uh, repeatedly uh, proposed improvements to the, uh, the Warm Home Discount, uh, an expanded uh, scheme that would be combined with other measures in Scotland, and the UK Government uh, chose not to take up our proposals uh, and to, to delay any confirmation even of the continuation uh, of the scheme. I, I do hope that the uh, UK Government will do more. Uh, it is very clear that there is huge pressure on them, even from some of their own backbenchers, to do more uh, and to act more swiftly to support people in relation to the cost of living crisis. The, the figures that I mentioned earlier uh, speak for themselves about the scale of response that is required. So this will be a life or death decision for, for some uh, individuals and families uh, this year and as we approach the autumn. I very much hope that the UK Government will reconsider their approach and do so urgently. Meanwhile, the Scottish Government will continue to do everything we can with our powers and in particular uh, with the energy efficiency measures that we are supporting to cut people's fuel bills that way. And brief supplementary, please, Stephanie Callaghan. Thank you. Uh, while it is great that many people are getting help with new boilers under the Warmer Homes Scotland scheme, um, the decision in May 2017 to exclude non-traditional construction properties from funding for external wall insulation means that a lot of expensive energy is still wasted, and this affects many, many local authority houses. Would the Scottish Government consider a review, given the current cost of living crisis? Minister. Um, well, these types of properties are included as part of our fuel poverty and energy efficiency schemes, for example. Uh, we have provided £64 million to local authorities to deliver external wall insulation through our area-based schemes this year. These, these local schemes target fuel poverty and benefit exactly the kind of hard-to-treat properties that the member describes. And this approach has improved the homes of over 100,000 fuel poor households since 2013. Many of these uh, properties are uh, ex-local authority properties in mixed tenure blocks. They are often very technically complex to insulate and they require other essential repairs. Uh, and so the neighbourhood approach to improvements uh, is often the best solution all round. We are continuing to look at more ways to provide help with insulation uh, and over the coming months uh, we will consider all the options to insulate uh, and improve more homes. Question number four, Russell Finlay. Yeah, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with ScotRail regarding returning rail services to pre-pandemic levels. Minister Jenny Goodruth. Throughout the pandemic, Transport Scotland officials have worked closely with the rail industry via the Rail Recovery Task Force to ensure that scheduled train services have met overall passenger demands. And whilst passenger demand remains well below that seen prior to the pandemic, I fully expect ScotRail to keep its timetable under review with scope to adapt where feasible to provide the most reliable service for passengers. Russell Finlay. Uh, thank you for that answer. The Minister omitted to mention that today ScotRail revealed that from next week nearly one third of their services will be cut. That is 600 daily services across Scotland, and at this rate, they will have more ferries than trains. Now, this will cause absolute misery for passengers up and down the country. Minister, do you share ScotRail's view that the unions and drivers are to blame? And if not, who is responsible for another calamitous chapter in SNP's nationalised rail? Minister. I, presiding officer, do not agree with the characterisation from Mr Finlay of this government's handling of uh, bringing rail services into public ownership. However, to reflect on some of the substantive points he has made, today I think we have seen 225 services affected with 138 full cancellations. So I would encourage any passengers who are watching to please check online in terms of the availability of services today. Now, Mr Finlay is correct that due to some drivers not taking up the option of overtime Sunday and rest day working, ScotRail has announced today plans to run a temporary reduced timetable from the 23rd of May, which is next week, to give a more stable and a reliable service for passengers. 
We know that people want certainty when they travel, and Scotland has therefore looked at how best to give that certainty during what is a really challenging time for passengers, and I recognise that absolutely. The temporary timetable will see services reduced by a level, but ScotRail will keep that under review, which is hugely important. And I think it is uh, worth saying that uh, an extension to the rest day working arrangements and additional payments for staff was negotiated by, uh, with ASLEF, and it continues to be in place until October of this year. But again, I would just appeal to trade unions, who of course campaigned so strongly for public ownership, to come back to the table to negotiate an agreement so that we can deliver on the timetable expectations, uh, which should, be, uh, should have been coming forward, of course, from last week with the new timetable. Supplementary, Jackie Dunbar. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The approach the Tories have taken to rail relations elsewhere in the UK is a prime example of how not to engage with a workforce. The UK Government refused to increase pay during the pandemic, and recent, recently we had a communications chief at Network Rail saying that rail workers should have probably worked harder at school. Mr Mark, does the please get to a relevant question. Thank you. Does the Minister share my disgust at these events, and will she join me in condemning the disdainful attitude of the Tories towards rail workers. Minister, please extract the relevant bits to the initial question. Thank you. Sir. Forgive me, presiding officer. Minister, in your response, if you could respond to the, I think what the member was trying to get at in terms of the fact that a supplementary must, of course, be relevant to the initial question. Thank you. Understood. Okay. It is disappointing, I think, that the UK Government appears not to be doing more to resolve the dispute south of the border. However, in Scotland, we have ensured that our general grade non-driving railway staff have already received the previously negotiated and agreed 2.2 per cent for this year, while negotiations, of course, continue with both ASLEFT and the RMT. And could I have a supplementary, please, from Graeme Simpson? Uh, many thanks. Can the Minister tell us how long the devastating 30 per cent cut in services will go on for? Minister. As I have already alluded in my response to Mr Finlay, this will be, the situation will be kept under review. I think it is worth saying that, of course, without COVID and the impact on training, ScotRail would have trained an extra 130 drivers by this point. That would have eliminated ScotRail's need for drivers to work overtime and rest days. But I will be speaking to ScotRail later this week to um, ask for that update that Mr Simpson has requested. And I'd be more than happy to share any further details on that with him. Um, before I uh, turn to the next question, five, could I please have less... Uh, commentary from a sedentary position and a bit more courtesy and respect on the part of all members to each other. Thank you. Question number five, Emma Harper. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with Transpen and the Express, Network Rail, Network Rail and ScotRail regarding the reported frequent cancellation of rail services on the West Coast Main Line, particularly impacting travellers using rail services at Lockerbie Station. Minister Jenny Goruth. Uh, rail services run by Avanti, West Coast and Transpennine Express stop at Lockerbie Railway Station. These are cross-border rail operators which are managed by the Department for Transport, though Transport Scotland participates in regular cross-border operator task force meetings. For the first part of this year, Transpennine Express services in particular have been impacted by the COVID-related issues and industrial action. However, recent performance data shows an improvement since February this year and from this week, and I can advise that Transpennine Express has increased calls at Lockerbie, offering customers broadly an early service northwards and southwards on weekdays. Emma Harper. I thank the Minister for that response. Passengers need assurance that services will be available and on time. I know the Scottish Government does not have control over Transpen and Express, but would the Minister agree with me that the sooner rail is fully devolved, the quicker we can provide certainty to passengers travelling to and from Lockerbie Station? Minister. Um, Emma Harper is right. We, we do need certainty for passengers in terms of travelling and in terms of which uh, services are operating. We heard that in the previous question. Ms Harper is also right to say that full devolution of rail powers is the long-stated aim of this Government, bringing track and train together and ensuring we have the levers we need to create that sustainable rail service into the future. But in the meantime, passengers must be reassured that during times of disruption, um, alternative options are available. And I will raise these services, of course, which are not ScotRail services, at Lockerbie directly with the UK Rail Minister when I meet with her next week. And officials will follow up with the operators to see what we can do to help improve on people's recent experience on this particular service. And supplementary, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. This is the worst train service in Britain, Minister. Now, there's a fair bit of competition for that title. But the problems are not new. Passengers from Lockerbie Station have been treated as second class since this very franchise began. So when the Minister meets 
with her UK counterpart? Will she join me in calling for an end to this failed franchise and it brought under new management? Minister. I will certainly raise some of the issues that Mr Smith has alluded to in terms of his constituents' experience of this service. Supplementary Sue Webber. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I have a suggestion that the Minister will find might focus the minds of the Government. Will the Minister make a commitment that for every day there is strike disruption, the ministerial limos will remain parked in solidarity with the Scott Rail passengers? Yes or no? Um, Minister, before trying to respond to that, I, I don't really think that's relevant actually at all. I, I appreciate it's the members' wish to, to, to try to conflate the two issues, but if the Minister wishes to make some comment in response, then please go ahead. No, Presiding Officer. I, I don't see the relevance of that to this question at all. Mr Kerr, uh, perhaps we could just do comments through the Chair. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I call question number six, Claire Baker. I have thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on progress with the Leavenmouth Rail Link, including the planned reopening date. Minister Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. We are uh, committed to delivering the new railway that will reintroduce passenger services for the first time in more than 50 years, benefiting communities, businesses and visitors in the Leavenmouth area. Transport Scotland and Network Rail are working closely with their industry partners and currently expect to deliver this transformational project by spring 2024. Construction is underway with the first mile of track and drainage already completed. Work continues on the route structures and site compounds are being established at key locations to provide uh, strategic links to on-site activities. Clear Baker. Um, thank you. The Minister will be aware of the strong desire from the community for the rail link to be the best that it can be. What discussions has he had with Network Rail about the delay in the public consultation and the need to get that underway? And in recognising the importance of the community's input into the station design in particular, what flexibilities are there in the budget um, for a station which would meet the needs and ambitions of the community and is designed for a growing population? Minister. Uh, I'm grateful uh, to Claire Baker for that supplementary. Uh, there is uh, currently uh, consultation uh, being undertaken, and I think it's important that that is undertaken comprehensively. I, I hope Claire Baker would join me in congratulating uh, the communities who campaigned long and hard uh, to ensure that we uh, have reached the point where we can see uh, the completion of this project uh, in the, the very near future. Uh, I'll happily write to Claire Baker regarding the budget issues uh, that she raises, but I would, I would hope that for the time being she agrees that consultation uh, should be undertaken and that the, the time is necessary to ensure that people's voices in communities affected uh, are heard. A supplementary, Mark Ruskell. Uh, it's been a dream uh, come true for communities who campaign for the Leavenmouth Rail Route to now see the tracks actually being relayed. And of course, the route also opens up opportunities for a rail freight facility working with Diageo, Malcolms and other local businesses. Um, but, Minister, it, it took 17 years for the Highland Spring Rail Fate Facility to be designed, developed and built. So what role can Transport Scotland play in accelerating the development of a rail freight facility on the Leavenmouth line, especially given the climate emergency? Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, Mark Ruskell is, of course, right. Uh, first, to acknowledge the, the hard work of, of campaigners, but also the very positive opportunities uh, for an expansion of rail freight. Uh, that's a, an economic uh, as well as an environmental opportunity. And the, the Scottish Government is leading the way uh, with the first of the, the kind of target for growth of rail freight as well as significant investment. And we look forward to uh, opportunities to uh, uh, include rail freight within all of our investment. Uh, and our approach to Leavenmouth Railway is no different. As such, we are working with stakeholders, including local businesses and Fife Council, to ensure that we maximise the economic, uh, social and environmental benefits for the area. Uh, and I'm sure that we will uh, all commit to continuing to proceed with that, with the momentum that Mark Ruskell's question demands. And before I call question seven, I would just say that I would like to take both questions seven and eight, but I really need brief questions and brief answers. Question number seven, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how the ambitions expressed in the first annual report to Parliament on the progress in developing the Environment Strategy for Scotland coincides with the findings of the latest IPCC report. Minister Mary McCallum. The Scottish Government's Environment Strategy sets out our overarching environmental response to the global climate and nature crises. 
Recent reports from the IPCC, as highlighted by the member, show the increased urgency of these efforts. Uh, the Environment Strategy Progress Report, which we published in March, recognised that while Scotland has made great progress in cutting our emissions, we must now go further and faster to reach our target of 75 per cent reduction by 2030. And we are considering all options on how to accelerate that progress. David Thomas. I thank the Minister for that answer. Leading scientists previously stated in the wake of the latest IPCC report that the UK Government is moving too slowly to tackle a climate emergency. Meanwhile, the UK Government's Brexit Minister declared that he supports exploiting every last cubic inch of gas from the North Sea. Does the Minister share my concern that if Tories get their own way, Brexit will become an act of environmental as well as social and economic vandalism? Minister. Presiding officer, I absolutely do. Uh, the Scottish Government has made clear our commitment to remain aligned with the EU on environmental standards, the EU, of course, being a beacon of progress in environmental policy. That's in stark contrast to the UK Government, whose cringeworthy entitled uh, Brexit Freedoms Bill seems intent to abandon legislation that has protected Scotland's environmental interests for almost 50 years. <laughs> And question number eight, Stephen Kerr. Ask the Scottish Government support it is giving to local authorities to enable them to reduce scope three emissions. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to continuing working closely with local authorities to tackle the global climate emergency. We published new climate reporting guidance to public bodies, including local authorities, in October 2021, which included specific guidance on reducing indirect scope 3 emissions. The Cabinet Secretary of Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform and the Minister for Trade, Innovation and Public Finance also wrote to the Chief Officers and public bodies on the 16th of March 2021 with a call to action to decarbonise the £13.3 billion annual public sector supply chain. A follow-up uh, Scottish Government procurement note in 2021 also highlighted the national sustainable procurement tools uh, in order to support uh, this work going forward. Stephen Kerr. The Scottish Government has not set a target for reductions in scope 3 emissions. This is a hugely important part of emissions from local authorities, covering, as the Cabinet Secretary said, procurement and supply chain issues. Instead of working with councils and offering support in expertise and funding, they have simply given an exemption when it is inconvenient to do the work. Why has the Scottish Government simply abandoned this issue because it's too hard? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, it becomes a pattern in here with Mr Kerr getting things badly wrong. So the Scottish Government has already uh, issued a guidance and actually the regulations which were approved by this Parliament uh, uh, back in Ebdico uh, uh, previously, uh, which have been set out for local authorities. And it says very clearly the responsibility that they require through the new guidance. Public bodies need to publish details on what they are doing to tackle scope three emissions, which is part of the procurement duty process. Importantly, which I am sure Mr Kerr will welcome, the data which was published recently shows that emissions from public bodies, operations and electricity use has fallen by a third since 2015-16. And uh, emissions from uh, public bodies uh, and their electricity use has halved since 2015-16. It, cl it clearly doesn't like the information I'm providing them with. Um, uh, and of course, uh, 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 importantly, Mr. Cabinet, please resume your seat for a wee second. Thank you very much. I, I have already said I don't want a lot of sedentary commentary, and I've already asked members if they will please listen to the answers given in terms of ensuring that the question session is meaningful. Point of order, Stephen Kerr. Patients, presiding officer. But what I'm asking for is an answer to the question I asked, not what he's got written down in front of him from a civil service briefing. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Kerr, that is not a point of order. The chair is not responsible for the substance of ministerial responses, or indeed anybody's responses. I would ask, please, for some courtesy and respect right across the chamber, so that we can ensure that we make these sessions as productive as possible for all. Please resume, Cabinet Secretary. Absolutely. There, there are many other useful uh, data points I could give here to Mr Kerr, which I'm sure he wouldn't like to hear as well, because it wouldn't uh, feed the narrative that he has about trying to talk down our local authorities. But the final point I will make is that Mr Kerr will recognise that the regulations have been put in place. Well, I think he now recognises that the regulations have been put in place. But it's for local authorities, as corporate bodies, to set their target dates. And that means that it's their local elected members that are responsible for setting out how they will do that. 
That's the local councillors who were just elected over two weeks ago. I know the elections two weeks ago were not good for Mr Kerr and his party, but I trust our local authorities to get this right, and it's very clear from our track record over recent years they're doing exactly that, but they'll be doing it this time with even less Tories involved in doing it. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes portfolio questions, and there will be a very short pause before we move on to the next item of business to allow front bench teams to move positions, should they wish. Thank you.